Okay. What is the date today? 4th of April, year of our Lord 2023. I'm Jim Munchback, and we are about to start another lecture in personal finance at the University of Houston at the Bauer College of Business. So today we're going to talk about the perfect investment strategies. Uh, we're going to review what we covered last week, and so let's get started. I'm going to jump into the Zoom room and uh, bring some folks into <clears throat> the room. Here we go. Okay, welcome, welcome aboard to the Zoom room. Hey, uh, if you would, please let me know you can hear me. I'm looking at the chat right now and hoping you can hear me. Christian, can you hear me? Hope you're doing good. Orlando, welcome. Uh, let's see. Connecting to audio. Thank you, Christian. I appreciate that. Okay, we're going to get started here pretty quick. Uh, we'll give everybody a couple minutes. It's, I'm a little early, apparently. So, if you guys have any questions, now's a good time to pop them into the chat box. Uh, otherwise, we will just play around with some backgrounds until we get started. Let's see. Today, is it the beach? Uh, the beach. The, what do you think about the beach? When will the assignment nine grades be posted? That's a great question, Christian. I was out of town last week, moving actually, uh, and so I haven't graded anything from last week. But today, by the end of the day, by five o'clock, they will be posted. In fact, I think if you check, Christian, and if you wouldn't mind, please do check to see. Uh, I believe that the assignment for next week has not yet been posted, and I'll do that as well today. <clears throat> wanted to first just, uh, well, we're going to do a review. So we'll do a review of the assignment that you will be doing this week. Um, but yes, yeah, sorry, I haven't gotten those graded yet. I usually get them graded, um, you know, over the weekend, the early ones. So if you submitted your assignment early, you will still get those extra points. Okay, yeah, it's not yet posted. Sorry. I'm running behind. Um, we were, well, we were living at uh, Stephen F. Austin State Park. My wife is a park host there, and I've been trying to work back and forth. And we completed our assignment, her assignment. In uh, so Friday, we were moving. We were moving our RV to a storage unit, and I just recovered over the weekend. It was <laughs> a lot of work Friday. So, sorry about that. Hope you're doing good. Any other questions, comments? Okay, let's see. It's still a little early. <clears throat> so today we're going to pick up a little review from last week and then move forward into the four investment strategies that uh, we talked about. And these were posted in Money Study Group. So you have uh, hopefully been spending a little time thinking about and reading about and learning about investments and basics related to investing. Uh, in order to really take advantage of today's lesson, you kind of have to have a basic understanding of uh, a few essential elements of investing. So for those of you who are here, if you would, and by the way, if you're not here, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Welcome. Uh, welcome if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. I think Facebook or YouTube, rather, probably YouTube, is m more popular at this point than even the Zoom meeting because the, the Zoom uh, platform degrades the, in the, the video so much. If you're watching on YouTube, you actually get a, a higher quality picture. So I'm getting lots and lots of comments from YouTube. And if you're watching on YouTube, then please continue to interact with the little comments below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel uh, so that you get notified. If you hit the little bell, by the way, on YouTube, uh, you will get these crazy little notifications. The bell will go off every time 
we do a live stream or we post new content to the channel. And I'm hoping that you uh, will kind of stay connected with me after we graduate, after you graduate. So feel free to do that. Uh, Here's my first question, though. I'm curious about how, what's your experience, good and bad, with investing? So have you invested any money in anything? Do you, are you finding the idea of investing something that makes you interested or does it make you anxious? Just tell me a little bit about your experience with investing. And if you have no experience, then tell me how you're feeling about learning how to invest. So that's typically investment is like the most popular topic in this course. Uh, Introduction to personal finance. We cover a lot of information. And one of the things we try to cover somewhat thoroughly is investment management, investment planning, investing in general. And so to do that, I really focus on five things, five uh, ideas mainly. There's so much more to learn, and you really need to understand certain things like asset classes if you're going to take advantage of these investment strategies that I'm going to teach you. But the five things are, it starts with the perfect investment. And as you will recall, we will review that today. But that's your 401k, your company matched 401k. It's like the number one thing that I hope when you uh, finish this course, you will be prepared to do on day one uh, when you get that dream job is to know exactly what to do to take advantage of your company 401k and the match that is provided by your employer. So we'll go over that a little bit today. But then I also want to teach you four investment strategies that are pretty basic. So it is time to get started. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, And I've posted this uh, at missionalmoney.com. Uh, It's also going to be posted in Money Study Group. It's just a review. This is a review. I did add a table of contents to this post, but uh, and there's the table of contents. So I won't I won't go over all of that. I just want you to know it's available so you can read up if you're feeling at all uh, like you are you know, not really comfortable with a 401k employer matching program. This post is just designed to help you get up to speed. Also included in this one, uh, an example with a little bit of math. So let me show you that. Uh, I'm just going to scroll down. And again, I think hopefully this, we stuck to the same example that we used uh, last week. The example was very simple. If you missed it, Hopefully you didn't, but if you did, uh, the example we used last week was a student who graduates and gets their dream job, and we made the assumption that the employee was earning $100,000 a year. Now, that may seem like a lot of money, and it is, I think, a lot of money, certainly more money than I ever made after after graduating from college. Uh, although I got to tell you a story real quick. One of my, one of the, When I first did this assignment... Uh, your job was and is to do a little research to figure out how much would you make if you got your dream job. And I remember the first one of the first papers I graded, it was a student who she was a really good student uh, and she always turned her assignments in early and she was she, she spoke like three different languages. She was really a cool person. But anyway, she turned in her assignment and in her assignment, she said, my dream job is XYZ at XYZ ABC company or whatever. And um, I'm going to, in my dream job, I'll earn $250,000 a year. And this is what, and at that time I made them, you know, update the financial plan and show a little bit about what that would look like 10 years down the road. And the numbers were staggering. They were just ridiculous. And, you know, for a college graduate. And so I pushed back and gave her a little deduction and said, you know, let's take another stab at that. Uh, 
Well, come to find out, she already had the job, <laughs> and she was making a quarter million dollars a year. Apparently, she had some very specific skills that involved communication and languages and international uh, roles. So anyway, I have no idea what's reasonable or not in terms of that dream job that you might get. I do know that if you're graduating from a business college, the Bauer College of Business, your chances of getting a job that pays much better than um, graduating from a no-name college with, uh, you know, a degree in basket weaving or even education. I graduated with a degree in education and you just don't get paid a lot in a lot of those fields. So in this example you're making a hundred grand and you're working for a company that gives you an eight percent match. So I've kind of spelled that out and I included some math here and this is based on a seven percent growth rate. So and that assumes that you're making your contribution every year and remember the key to taking advantage of the perfect investment is you have to know what is your company match in this case it's eight percent so in this case you are contributing eight percent of your salary every two weeks you get paid and it comes right out of your check and goes right into your 401k account and in that scenario you're You've made sure that you know how much you're going to need to contribute so that you equal $8,000 a year coming out of your paycheck going into your 401k. That's what the example was last week. So all I've done here is taken that example and added a little bit of math because I wanted to just show you with a only 7% annual growth which, you know, some years you're going to have 7%, some years you're going to have 20%, some years you're going to have negative 3%. Uh, and so over the years, though, using the strategies that we will go over today, you'll begin to see how the volatility in the market, when the market goes up and down, and your growth rate from year to year goes up and down, you'll see that how over the years you will be building wealth in a very powerful way using these strategies. And this strategy, the perfect investment, your 401k, contributing to a company-funded, company-matched 401k, you know, I call it the perfect investment because it really is like the most powerful part of your financial plan. So just looking at these with 7% growth, you can see how much it, uh, you're, you're gaining somewhere in there. I thought I put the totals. Maybe I had I have some notes, but we'll but but you will see the totals because what you're going to do is you're going to in your financial plan part of your assignment for next week is going to be to set up your 401k in your financial plan so that you can see the numbers and depending on your asset allocation which we'll go over in a few minutes depending on how you allocate your assets in your 401k will make a big difference in terms of uh what kind of returns you'll have over time. So I just wanted you to see uh, just how much the investments begin to grow in addition to the $8,000 that you contribute to your 401k and then the $8,000 each year that your employer contributes, which totals $16,000 going into your account every year. Again, this is based on you make hundred grand, you got an eight, you get an eight percent match, and you contribute just up to that match. You could contribute more for sure, but this example is just to show you the power of taking advantage of the perfect investment. So you can see with 7%, that 7% grows based on the balance of your account each year. And so that at the end of 10 years, you're, you're growing a considerable amount. Okay, let's jump into uh, the four investment strategies. That's what we're going to do next. And if you go to this post, the review post, uh, and it will, again, it will be in... Uh, money study group as well but I put these links so you will we'll go directly to each of these strategies so let's do that now uh, first one is diversification and I'm about to jump into four investment strategies we talked about the perfect investment and 
the perfect investment is actually a type of account, the 401k or the company match. But just by having a 401k set up and even having your 401k set up with your employer and even with you contributing to the 401k plan, that's just a type of account. That's just, that's just money going into an account. You haven't invested it yet. And so these next four investment strategies are designed to help you know exactly what to do when you get started uh, and why you want to use these strategies to maximize returns in your 401k account and to minimize risk. And so that's really the key, to maximize returns over time and to minimize risk. And that's what we're going to talk about in these four investment strategies. If you happen to watch the video that I posted in Money Study Group, it was just a different day. Really the same lesson, the same four strategies. I do this every semester. And so today I'll do it in a little different way, I'm sure. But uh, this, this post is kind of new, uh, Diversification Lessons from Three Corporate Scandals. And you can read that. Uh, I cover Enron, WorldCom, and Lehman Brothers. And Lehman Brothers today is an interesting one because we just had the Silicon Valley Bank go go bye-bye. Um, we're having a pretty interesting time in the market today. Uh, I think the regional bank conundrum will continue, and I think it's not over. I think the more that the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, the more pressure they're going to put on financial institutions, especially regional banks, where they don't have the same types of support that the big banks, the ones that are too big to fail, so I won't get into that today, but I just thought it would be interesting to remind us that when it comes to diversification, one of the things that's critical is to not put all of your eggs in one basket. That's really the idea of, of diversification. And these three scandals, uh, are three catastrophes, Lehman Brothers, if you dig into the story of what happened at Lehman Brothers, you'll see that it was kind of a scandal, not kind of. It was, it was greed um, taking over uh, common sense in terms of risk management, just like in Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, the way that bank was run was criminal. And the bailout that they got should have been criminal, in my opinion. Um, but anyway, Enron, different story. I had a client, I had a couple of clients who worked for Enron. And so uh, I always tell the story about Enron when I'm talking about risk, when I'm talking about diversification in the context of risk. And somewhere we have a picture of Enron. It's an old picture I grabbed on. Mr. Google gave me that one. Um, but Enron, Enron was uh, a company that made a lot of money. In 2001, they filed for bankruptcy. Uh, I always wonder if that's the right date. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but apparently, yeah. In 2002 was WorldCom. Lehman Brothers 2008. So these were companies that if you had too much of your money in any of these companies, you would have had an experience like one of my clients had at Enron. This client um, actually, he worked, Bill was his name, he worked for Enron. He was a middle manager uh, and he put all of his 401k money into Enron stock. And then when Enron started to fail, the leaders of Enron came and had a big meeting with the employees and they just pronounced that there has never been a better time to invest in Enron. They knew that the company was about to collapse and they were, you know, they were in the last stages of being found out really the way they were cooking the books. But any Anyway, they went to their employees and they basically said, you should continue to invest in Enron. And Bill believed them and he did that. He continued to put, you know, everything he had into Enron stock. Because now, after watching his 401k grow to a million dollars and then drop a lot, 
he thought he had this opportunity to take advantage of that lower price. And he believed that his Enron stock would go back to the all-time highs that it was before. And so it was greed uh, and a lack of diversification that caused Bill to go through one of the most anxious moments, seasons of his life. And he ended up uh, experiencing a heart attack and dying. And so I was working with his wife, who had never worked. She she needed help with her financial plan. She didn't really have a financial plan because Bill took care of all of that. She had no skills in terms of work. She ended up working as a teacher's aide uh, with really no skills, just basically being a daytime babysitter with, you know, supervision from a teacher. And she... You know, she had to live and continue living in spite of the fact that she didn't have uh, any nest egg. It just evaporated with Enron. And so that story, knowing her, working with her, experiencing the pain that she went through, not just losing her husband, but being left without anything. She, they were, They were broke. She was broke. And it was because... They didn't diversify. They had all of their investments. And one of the things I want you to just think about as you prepare to go out into the workforce and get a job, when you start working for a company, you know, the folks at that company are going to want to convince you that they're the best of breed. They're the best company in the business, especially in their business. And that may be true. And that may be a good reason for you to invest in your company stock. But what I want you to be careful about is not to invest too much in your company stock. And so, uh, you know, you're going to be offered lots of ways to invest. You're going to be incentivated to invest in your company stock. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I am saying don't put all of your 401k in your company stock. In fact, you should limit it to somewhere around 10 to 15 percent, in my opinion. Um, but do some research. Make sure you're not putting too much money in your company stock like Bill did. Now, another story from Enron is a, uh, a lady who became a client. Her name was Andrea, and she was a middle manager as well. But she did it a little differently. Instead of putting all of her money in Enron, stock in her 401k. She diversified. She just did it the way most people would, should invest. And she did this before she met me. By the time she met me, she had a significant amount of money she had saved in her 401k and other investments. Um, but she was smart. She was a middle manager at Enron. And when that collapsed, she moved on to another career and she was able to roll over her 401k. K and and I helped her manage that in a way that continued to give her some pretty good returns over the years. So the point is diversification. The one story I always tell is the story of Enron today in this post. Um, there's whoop, there's a few more stories. So uh, if you're not if you don't know about these companies, they're kind of interesting to read about. But mostly what I want you to do is just be aware that one of the most important investment strategies you need to be aware of is the simplest, most basic investment strategy of all. It's diversification. It just means basically don't put too much in any one thing. Okay, so now let's jump into the next one. Asset allocation is uh, hands down the most important investment strategy you will ever need to understand. And and as I said, I'm going to go ahead and click on the link. It should take me to that post, asset allocation. Uh, as I said at the beginning, if you don't understand asset classes, if you don't understand the difference between a large cap stock and a small cap stock, an international company stock, a bond, a U.S. government bond or a corporate bond, a high, uh, high quality corporate bond versus a junk bond. Um, if you don't know the difference between these basic asset classes, then you're not going to be able to really understand uh, or appreciate 
the power of asset allocation. So I want you to just, you know, there's tons of information out there, uh, but I put posted quite a bit of information in Money Study Group, and you were your job this week was to review some of that. There was a quiz. The quiz, though, is really not that complex. It's not that challenging. And so you, you know, you're not, I'm, I don't expect you to become an expert in investing or even in asset allocation. I don't even expect you to become an expert in asset classes. But what I do expect, what I do hope, what I do want is for you to understand asset classes sufficiently so that when you look at your 401k options, when it comes time, when you sit down with HR, not only are you going to have to know how much will you contribute to your 401k, but you're also going to want to know how much, how much am I going to contribute to my 401k so that I don't miss out on $1 of the company match. That's number one. And you probably should invest more than just enough to get the company match. But I want to make sure that you at least contribute enough to your 401k so that you get the full company match and you need to know how to do that and that's what we talked about last week that is the perfect investment uh, but in addition to that when you sit down with hr and you make that decision that commitment to invest in your 401k the next step is they're going to ask you okay how do you want that investment how do you want those 401k contributions to be invested okay do you understand the difference it starts out it's just a type of account you're putting money into this account a 401k but then you have to uh uh oh, looks like there's some folks in the waiting room. Let me see if I can fix that. Sorry, uh, thank you, Orlando, for telling me that. Let me see if I can admit. Okay. Welcome, those of you who are in the waiting room. I'm going to give you a minute. Uh, so sorry about that. Maritza, welcome. I'm so sorry you guys were stuck in the waiting room. I, it didn't pop up on my screen. Let's see. Okay, I've, I've admitted everyone who was in the waiting room. Okay, thank you, Orlando, for that reminder. That I really appreciate that. Welcome aboard, you guys. I see some are still, uh, still connecting. Hi, Maritza, Rosh, uh, Maria. I'm so sorry you guys got stuck in the waiting room. Welcome aboard. We're talking about investment strategies. We reviewed the, uh, and by the way, this is being posted in the YouTube playlist. So you can go back and watch the beginning, pick up anything that you missed in the YouTube playlist. Uh, and you could even hit the, you know, whenever I watch YouTube, I always do it at twice the speed. So my assumption, my belief, I... I'm pretty sure you can listen twice as fast as I can talk, even more than that. So feel free to do that. Go back to go to the YouTube playlist and pick up what you missed. But so far, I covered a kind of a review of the perfect investment, the 401k. Just covered the example that we went through last week. Uh, real quick, let me just show you that I posted this uh, on missionalmoney.com. It's called the Perfect Investment Review, and these links are in the play in the YouTube in the YouTube video. These links are in the comment section. So you just if you go to the video, you'll see the, these links, and they will also be in Money Study Group. Um, but in reviewing the 401k, I added a little bit of numbers here just to show you what happens if you if it grows at 7%. So you may want to go check that out. And then also here are the four links. So we've already talked about diversification. If we click on that, if you click on that, you'll see what we just talked about. Uh, and I really highlighted a story of Enron. So... Let me go back. And now we're jumping into asset allocation. And I was basically saying that uh, you, you won't really be able to appreciate the power of asset allocation uh, 
especially in your 401k, if you don't have a basic idea and understanding of asset classes. So that's been that's something you'll want to begin to learn. Because when you sit down at HR and you say, yes, I want to contribute to my 401k, here's how much I want to contribute to my 401k, the next question is going to be, okay, what do I want to invest in my 401k? And for you to be able to take advantage of this investment strategy, asset allocation, you're going to need to understand a little bit about asset classes. The difference between a large company stock, a small cap stock, an international stock, a bond, whether it's a government, U.S. government bond, or maybe it's a Russian bond or a Chinese bond. It could be an international bond, a U.S. government bond, or it could be a corporate bond. A U.S., say it's an Apple or Google bond. Or maybe it's a general electric bond. Or maybe it's a Baidu bond. So you see there's all these different asset classes and they all have a different level of risk with different types of risk depending on the asset class. But the most important investment strategy, the number one determinant of your portfolio's returns is asset allocation. So asset allocation is it's a really important uh, investment strategy. So that's what this post is, and there's a there's a nice little table of contents for you. One of the things I want to well, I always say that uh, asset allocation is the most important determinant of all the investment strategies, of all the things you can do in investing, the number one determinant of your portfolio's returns is asset allocation. And that's based on this Brinson study that I've been aware of since I became a certified financial planner. So it's a highly referenced study that shows why asset allocation is so important. So you can click on that link and it'll take you to that study, I think. Let's see if it does. Yes, the CFAinstitute.org is the determinants of portfolio performance. And in this report, Mr. Brinson, Gary P. Brinson, a CFA, that's a chartered financial analyst, he is going to uh, tell you that... Uh, Asset allocation is the most important determinant of your portfolio's returns. So that is uh, what we're going to talk about for a few minutes. Asset allocation, though, I mean, you see this little chart right there. Kind of gives you an idea. Imagine each of the slices of that pie was a different asset class. So the big red one there would be, uh, well, you can almost see them in this image. I should have just put an image with, uh, yeah, like that. So information technology, consumer staples, that's kind of what it looks like. And that's what your financial plan is going to look like, because one of the things you're going to do in your homework assignment is to is to play around with asset allocation. And the financial planning portal makes that super easy for you to do. So don't be intimidated by that. But just know that when you start playing with your asset allocation, you are playing with something that makes a big difference in your portfolio's returns over time. And so you're going to get a chance to play with that in your financial plan. Uh, but today we're just highlighting the four investment strategies that are designed to help you maximize returns and minimize risk. So far we've talked about diversification. We shared the story about Enron. WorldCom, uh, Lehman Brothers, uh, what's that bank that's been in the news? Uh, yeah, that bank, Silicon Valley Bank. So if you were an investor and you had all your money in Silicon Valley Bank, you know, your $10 billion, <laughs> that wasn't smart. Uh, because you weren't diversified. And even though in that situation with Silicon Valley Bank, what's what you're not doing in terms of diversification is you're not putting your money at different institutions. So you didn't diversify your cash. But that's really not the same as diversifying your investments. Uh, it's a little bit different. But it's still the same idea, not putting all of your eggs in one basket. 
so asset allocation is a really important it's the number one determinant of your portfolio's returns, but it's really a good way to manage risk and to maximize returns. So that article is for you. And I also put in this just for fun. You don't have to do this, um, but if you want to, you're welcome to click on this link. Somewhere there's a link. Uh, maybe not. I could put a link in there. But if you go to if you go to the website, well, I thought I put it in there. Apparently, I did not. Uh, so sorry about that. Never mind. Uh, you, I have this really cool piece of technology at my company, Bayrock. It's called Riskalyze, and I thought I put the. Uh, apparently, I did not. Uh, I could. I'll go back and put the link in. But it's a just a five-minute survey where you get to see what your risk number is. And if you're interested, if if you're interested in uh, understanding how uh, we set up asset allocation, it's based on one of the things it's based on is your risk tolerance. So as a professional, as a certified financial plan or professional, as an investment advisor, there, we have a really great piece of technology to help first identify what is your comfort level with risk and then from there we figure out if you have a portfolio how much risk do you have in your portfolio today does that align with how much risk you're comfortable with and then the next step is to say okay based on your risk tolerance and your risk number Here's the portfolio we would recommend. It's a really slick process, a really slick program. It makes my job very kind of scientific. So anyway, sorry I don't have the link there. I just uh, goofed. Okay, so that's asset allocation. Again, the number one determinant of your portfolio's returns, asset allocation. So we've reviewed the perfect investment, the 401k, and how your company match is the perfect investment. Nowhere else are you going to get that kind of return where you get to double your money up to the amount of the match. So if you have that opportunity throughout your life, make sure you never miss it. You can't imagine how many people I've worked with throughout my career as a financial professional uh, who didn't have weren't taking advantage of what I call the perfect investment. And it's like, come on, let's start there. You don't need me as a professional advisor. You don't need to pay me to help you manage money. You need to just do the basic things that are right in front of you. And that is the kind of like the, the biggest mistake I've seen, I think, one of them anyway. So good luck with that. Uh, do that, the perfect investment, and then learn a little bit about these other investment strategies. I promise you they're not complicated. They're not difficult. Um, just learn a little bit. Learn enough for today. And by the time you have to make the decisions with your 401k, so far you've got it, right? Diversification, you're not going to put too much in one asset class. You're certainly not going to put too much in your own company stock, right? That's diversification. Asset allocation is where you get a little bit more selective and you start to not just diversify, but you strategically place or allocate your assets according to whatever options you have in your 401k. And those options are often very limited. So that makes it easy, right? If you only have four options, you, you know, there you go. Pick four. You only have four, pick four, 25% each. If you have 10, it makes it a little more difficult. If you have a great company 401k plan where you have hundreds of options, call me and I'll help you figure out a great way to set up your asset allocation. That's a great problem to have if you're an investment if you, you know, if you really want to have a great portfolio, having more options is typically better than fewer options. I'm working with a client right now who has over a million dollars and he has a very limited number of options in his 401k. It's kind of sad, so, but it is what it is. You know, you got to do what you can do with what you have. So asset allocation is really key. So the next strategy I want to talk about, by the way, if you have any questions, go ahead and pop them into the 
uh, pop them into the chat box. I can still see the chat box. I have so many things on my screen. I'm sorry I didn't catch that there were people waiting in the waiting room. I, I feel really bad about that. But uh, do ask a question if you have it now before we jump into the next investment strategy. Again, these four investment strategies are designed to help you maximize returns and minimize risk. And they don't just work for college students. Okay, this is these investment strategies work regardless of where you are in your investing journey. So if you're a do-it-yourself investor, this is a great place to start. Maybe a little coaching along the way to help you uh, tweak things is all you need to be very successful in building wealth. The key is always to manage risk. You want to maximize returns and minimize risk. And these four investment strategies help you do that. So now let's jump into my favorite, certainly my favorite story to tell, is uh, dollar cost averaging with Farmer Joe. And this is a young Farmer Joe. I just found this picture and said, he's going to be my Farmer Joe. I don't have a clue who this guy is. But I've got several pictures of him from my photo deposit, whatever it is, the place that I get inexpensive photos. So anyway, this guy is going to be our Farmer Joe, and he's going to help us understand dollar cost averaging. So there again, we have a little table of contents. Uh, and I say dollar cost averaging is the, this is how I describe it. Every semester, I describe dollar cost averaging as the most powerful investment strategy to help you maximize returns and minimize risk. So again, all four of these strategies are designed with that objective in mind, to maximize returns, to build wealth, but also to minimize risk, to preserve the wealth that you've built. And when it comes to uh, powerful investment strategies, to me, I believe and I'm convinced and I've seen how it works, not just for me, but for clients and investors across the globe. Dollar cost averaging is the most powerful investment strategy to help you maximize returns and minimize risk. And I want to show you how that works. And I'm going to use an example with Farmer Joe. So here we go with Farmer Joe. Farmer Joe, by the way, was a client and uh, not really a client, but in the story, he was a client who owned a farm, which is why he's a farmer, because he has a farm and he had some money to invest. OK, so Farmer Joe was a farmer and he needed to invest. So we talked it over. What would you like to invest in? And Farmer Joe didn't have any cows in his farm. He had other things like chickens and pigs and, and chickens and pigs and some goats. But he didn't have cows. And so turns out cows have a lot of uh, utility value in, in addition to barbecue. I don't know if you're a meat eater. I know some of you are not a meat eater. And, and I'm sorry for that because I think... Barbecue is one of my favorite things in the world. I like barbecue. I like to barbecue. I'm going to be barbecuing in a few minutes. My wife is um, delivering some food to this ministry, and and she bought a bunch of chicken. So I'm going to put it on the smoker and on my Traeger and make smoked chicken. Anyway, Farmer Joe didn't have cows, and he thought it'd be a good idea. So he was going to invest in cows. And so we talked about a strategy, and we discovered this beautiful strategy called dollar cost averaging. So Farmer Joe commits to a systematic investment plan where he's going to invest $100 a month on cows. So we get started. So let's see how we get started. So I wish I could write on my... I need an app that lets me write on my iPad while I'm looking at a web page because I'm looking at a web page and I can do some cool stuff but I can't write on it so I'm just gonna talk you through it actually let me scroll down there's another picture of Farmer Joe uh, so yeah this is a this is where I put kind of an illustration in 
That is not a cow, by the way. That is, I believe, can you tell me what that is? If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, this is a good time for you to uh, consider the points that you can get for class collaboration because today I am randomly going to suggest that if you will describe this animal and tell me what it is I will you can use that as a screenshot for your class collaboration anybody in zoom want to leave a comment tell me it's a goat yeah that's it it's a goat it's not a cow why is it in here? I have no idea. I just know. Wait, that's not a cow. It's a goat. So here we go. This is, this is somewhere along the way I took this chart of cows and I put some numbers. And I know it looks a little confusing, but if you... This, you can go to this post and look at it yourself. I don't mean to be confusing, but here we have a list, month one through month seven. So in this chart, we have seven months, those big dots there. Each of those dots represent a month. And again, how much was Farmer Joe and his investing plan, what was his commitment, his systematic investing plan, which is dollar cost averaging, he chose to invest in cows. So how much was he going to spend each month buying cows? How much per month was Farmer Joe going to spend buying cows? You can post that in the comments if you want. And in, in, uh, here we are in zoom i'm looking at the at the chat and i don't see it so i'll just tell you yeah it was a hundred bucks so every month he's going to buy cows and he's going to spend a hundred bucks so how many cows can you get how many head of cattle can you buy for a hundred bucks so in this particular month month number one cows were one hundred dollars a head so that's why we have one hundred dollars right there month number one is scribbled down $100. Month number two, though, cows go to $50. He, he spends $100, but cows, I should have written down, they were $50 bucks each. So in month number two, the, the value of cows dropped from $100 to $50 a head. But remember, Farmer Joe is investing $100 a month, so he's going to be able to buy month two. Let's go back to the little chart, if I can find it. Month two, they're 50 bucks per cow, so he gets two cows in month number two. What do you think happens in month number three? Cows drop in half again. That's a big drop. So what does Farmer Joe do? He buys four cows that month. So that's why we have four cows. In month number three, he gets four cows. So far, does this make sense? Am I losing anyone? This is an investment plan, a systematic investment plan. And remember, this story about Farmer Joe buying cows using a systematic investing plan it is to illustrate the investment strategy called dollar cost averaging. Imagine if Farmer Joe was doing the same thing with chickens and pigs and uh, tractors and whatever else he was investing in. And he was accumulating them over time with a systematic amount going towards whatever he's buying. You're doing the same thing with stocks and bonds and other investments is over time you're committing and your 401k is a good example. You're committing however much you're contributing to your 401k every month or every other week whenever you get paid. It's going into your 401k account. So let that sink in for a minute. You're contributing to your 401k every couple of weeks whenever you get paid. But that doesn't mean you're investing. It's just going into that account. But remember, you sat down with HR and you said, OK, here's how I want to allocate my my distributions or how I want to allocate my portfolio so that every time you put money into your account, your 401k goes out and buys 
It could, you know, in this case, we're talking about cows. In your case, maybe you're buying a little bit of the S&P 500, the large cap U.S. stocks. And you're buying also a, a little bit of those small cap stocks. And maybe you're buying a little bit of international bonds or government bonds. But whatever you set up as your asset allocation, that's what you're buying. And you're buying a certain amount based on your systematic investment plan in your 401k. You're automatically putting money in every on a systematic basis every time you get paid. And every time it goes into that account, in that account, it goes out and buys each of these pieces of assets, investments that you set up as your asset allocation. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense because to connect the dots from your 401k to Farmer Joe's cows, it's important just to understand that this story illustrates how it works and why dollar cost averaging is the most powerful investment strategy I know of. So let's continue. So we've got Farmer Joe buying cows, 100 bucks a month. Month number three, cows dropped from 100 bucks the first month to 50 bucks the second month. They're down to 25 bucks a head. So with his 100 bucks, he gets to buy four cows. Now month number five comes along, and this is where things get a little interesting. Because what happens in month number five? Why? How could how could Farmer Joe possibly buy five cows for $100, what would be the price of a cow if you could buy five of them for $100? That's, that's crazy. They started at 100 bucks a head, and now they're only, what, how much? Help me out here. Post a comment. Come on, if you're watching in Zoom, give me a little love here, a little attention. I'm looking, I'm waiting. Thank you so much. Yeah, Sadaf says 20 bucks. That's right. So if you're spending 100 bucks and you get to buy five heads of cow for 100 bucks, that means you're buying them for 20 bucks each. Imagine if it was some type of investment that went from 100 bucks to 20 bucks. What would you want to do in your 401k? Well, before I answer that, let me tell you what happened with Farmer Joe. He calls me up. And he's not very happy at all because he's like, Jim, look, I've been investing in cows for how many months now? Only one, two, three, four months. And already cows have dropped to 20 bucks a head. This is crazy. I need out of this. This is crazy. I don't know what I was thinking. I think you talked me into it and I, I don't appreciate it. I want out. I'm like, OK, Joe, listen. I'm your, I'm your advisor, right? And if you're going to trust me, if you're going to follow my advice, then I can, I can be your advisor and I'll do my very best to give you honest, helpful advice. So here's my advice, Joe. Don't stop buying cows. You're able to buy five heads of cows for the same price you could buy one just four months ago. If anything, Joe... I would go sell that old John Deere tractor that you bought 10 years ago because funny thing happened through COVID. John Deere tractors, the old ones, the old ones that any farmer could fix on his own without getting a technician because now the new tractors that have chips, the chips are impossible to get. You have to have a technician to fix any simple little thing. But those old tractors, anybody can fix. So what happened to the price of those old tractors because of this unique situation we're in right now? That old tractor that you don't use because you already got a new tractor, you could sell that for three times as much as you paid for it because crazy thing with old John Deere tractors right now. I would go sell your old John Deere tractor. And I would put all that money into cows because they're cheap. And they may never be this cheap again. But it's your call, Joe. But that's my advice. Don't freak out. Don't be afraid. Keep doing what you're doing. And if you're going to change the plan, do a little more. Don't do any less. Keep doing it. So he says, okay. He thinks it over. 
he, he trusts me one more time, which I'm glad he did. And he turned out to be glad he did too, because the next month, the price of cows went back up to 25 bucks a head. So the next month, month number five, like we see here, month number five, he's able to buy four cows again, just like he was able to do in month number three. And then in month number six, cows go back to 50 bucks a head and he's down to buying only two. So that's what we got in the picture. Month number six, he's only able to buy two because they're 50 bucks a head. This same thing that happens with investments. They go up, they go down. If you have a systematic plan, which you will in your 401k, and you have it spread out over different asset classes, each of those asset classes are going up and down all the time. And you're able to buy more or less depending on the price. But your investment plan is systematic, just like Farmer Joe's. So anyway, the next month, you guessed it, cows are back to 100 bucks a head. And that's when Joe says, okay, that was fun. Uh, but what happens if I just go ahead and say cows are just too volatile. Like, I don't want to go through that again. It kept me awake at night. I was stressed out. I was anxious. I was nervous. So he, he says, okay, what, what happens if I get out? So let's just look at that. Joe invested how much money over seven months with his investment plan? You, you should know the answer. This is not a trick question. It's super simple. Seven months, a hundred bucks a month. Yeah, it was 700 bucks in total with a hundred bucks each month for seven months. And that is not a cow. So what happens then? Uh, let's see if we have, I think I put the math in here. Uh, so how many cows did he buy? By this end of the seven months, and this is easy to do. I think it's, I think I put the number here, but Let's just look. If you count the cows, that's seven months worth of cows. So let's just do that. I'm counting. I'm counting the cows. Month number one, you bought one cow. Month number two, two cows. Month number three, bought four cows. Five cows the next month, then four, then two, then one. My total comes up to be how many? How many, how many cows did you count? You can put it in the comments if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. How many cows did Farmer Joe buy in seven months? He bought how many cows? 19. That's how many cows he bought. So if Joe decides to sell all of his cows after the month number seven, how much are cows worth today in this scenario? 100 bucks a head. Remember, he bought his last cow for 100 bucks, so that's the market price. If he decides to sell all 19 of his cows, how much money will he have in his account? 19 times 100 is $1,900. Now, he only invested $700 to accumulate 19 cows, and then he sells all 19 cows for 100 bucks a head. He made a profit of how much? 1900 minus 700, which is what he invested, is a profit of $1,200. That's right, Maritza. $1,200 profit. And do you see how he did that? He used what I believe is the most powerful investment strategy of all, dollar cost averaging. Now, that's how it works, believe it or not, in your 401k or your IRA or whatever investment account that you set up on a systematic basis where you have your assets allocated across multiple asset classes. So if you're a farmer, you're buying chickens, cows, pigs, whatever else, ducks, emu, whatever. And the value of those are going to go up and down. Sometimes you're going to make a profit. Sometimes you're going to have a loss. But in, in your investments are the same way. Sometimes different asset classes are going to go way up and some are going to go down. But if they go down like the cows did, you're able to buy more of them. And over time, those assets go up and they go down. So what do you do next? You've accumulated 
Joe decided to sell all of his cows. And that's, you know what? I told him, hey, Joe, I agree. Now's a good time to sell your cows. I absolutely, let's, my advice is sell your cows because you, you know and I know that the price of cows is going to continue to go up and down. And you're just not cut out for that kind of volatility. So, you know, either you can get comfortable with that risk, you know, and do it over time. But either way, yeah, now's a good time to sell all your cows. And if they go back down to 20 bucks, you know how it works. Maybe we start buying cows again. I don't know. We'll talk about it then. But he sold his cows. It's a good idea. He made some money. That's what you want to do with investing. So... That is dollar cost averaging. Do you have any questions about that? Do you, does it make sense to you? Does it seem like something that you could put into play in your 401k? Hey, that rhymes. My grandson, Caleb, he keeps coming up with words that rhyme. Maddie, my granddaughter, too. They're, they're four and three, and everything's about rhyming. So is do you under I'm going to rhyme it again. Do you understand how you can put into play in your 401k this most powerful investment strategy designed to maximize returns and minimize risk? It's called dollar cost averaging. Do you get it? Does it make sense? I hope so. If it doesn't, just let it sink in. Remember the term, do a little reading and 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 just know that it's super easy to put this strategy into play in your 401k. It just simply means you select the asset allocation that, that you have access to in your 401k. You systematically put money into your 401k. The company systematically matches it. So you're automatically taking advantage of diversification, asset allocation, and dollar cost averaging. And those three strategies by themselves will help you build wealth over time. And they'll help you maximize returns and minimize risk at the same time. And then there's one more. Let's go, if I can go back to my list. One more is called portfolio rebalancing. And I'm just going to wrap this up, wrap up here real quick with portfolio rebalancing. So I'll just pop into the post. And I just want you to think about, well, there should be a picture. I, I like to use the idea of balancing a tire. And uh, so imagine that. I want to show you something real quick. I think this is where I had a picture of. No, I'm looking for the picture of. It's not here. I'm sorry. Maybe it was here. The picture that I had of, no, it's not here. You know, the picture of a circle with a portfolio with different slices of the pie. That's what I'm looking for. It's got to be right here in asset allocation. So this is what I'm looking for, that little picture right there. So let me just focus on this for a minute. Because portfolio rebalancing, it's a very simple idea. But what it means is, remember when you started out in your 401k, let's say you had four options, four options, large cap, small cap, uh, international, and U.S. government bonds. That's four things. And they're basic asset classes. And let's say that's your asset allocation. You did 25% in each of those. Now, this circle has more than more than four uh, assets in it. But over time, let's say that one of your four got really big like that one right there, that big piece of that pie. And then another one got really small, so it went down like Farmer Joe's cows. And so what do you want to do? You want to hit a button, and you don't even have to hit a button. You just tell your 401k if this is it, uh, if this is available in your 401k. Sometimes it can be automatically done every other, every six months, every quarter, every month. It's called portfolio rebalancing, and it the name is pretty self-explanatory. You just want to rebalance your portfolio to get back to its original asset allocation. And when you do that. 
it's kind of like dollar cost averaging because what you're doing is you're selling off taking profits for the section of your portfolio that went up and at the same time you're buying more of whatever went down so think about farmer joe cows pigs chickens and ducks and let's say his cows are you know now 300 bucks a piece and ducks are selling for 50 cents a piece he he knows that duck soup is just a really popular thing and he can make a lot of money by buying a lot of ducks very cheap so he sells you know some of his cows to reduce it to 25 percent of his portfolio and then he buys some ducks so that now he has 25 percent of his portfolio in ducks while he's able to buy them at a very very low price so portfolio rebalancing is just kind of another way to take advantage of something very similar to dollar cost averaging where you're rebalancing your portfolio by selling off the big some of the profits and investing in some of the things that shrunk and over time portfolio rebalancing is a great way to help you build wealth by maximizing returns and minimizing risk. Because remember, if those cows are 200 bucks ahead, what are they gonna do in a year or two? At some point, they're gonna be back to 20 bucks ahead, and then they're gonna go back up higher, and then they're gonna go lower. That's what investments do. And so your job is to recognize how asset classes work up and down and know that some asset classes go down while other asset classes go up. And so by taking advantage of portfolio rebalancing and dollar cost averaging together, you're getting to invest over time with a strategy that is specifically designed to help you maximize returns and minimize risk. So those are the four investment strategies. I hope you I hope you got them. I hope they make sense to you. I hope mostly that you begin to see how you can use your 401k and put these four investment strategies into play in your 401k uh, so that you can build wealth over time and minimize risk and maximize returns at the same time. So it is 11.05. We are out of time and I will post your assignment. I will grade your last week's assignments. I'll post next week's assignment and I'll wait just a minute to see if anybody has any questions in the Zoom room while I jump on over to end the broadcast. So I am going to end the broadcast. And for those of you who are leaving, have a great day. And Maritza, I'll be right back to answer your question. But first, let me finish.